Gresham College presents Human Livelihoods Depend on Wildflowers, Q's Millennium Seed Bank Explained by Dr. Robin Probert. Um, yes, I'm going to be talking about wildflowers and talking about Q's Millennium Seed Bank Partnership. In fact, this is the structure of, of my talk. I'm, I'm going to start by sort of uh, painting the broader picture, if you like, and explain about the importance of plants to our livelihoods but then focus really on the Millennium Seed Bank Partnership and, and what we do. So I'll talk about some of the activities of the, of, of the work we do. Uh, and I particularly want to tell you about a, a new initiative which we launched last year called the UK Native Seed Hub, which really is about wildflowers and uh, UK wildflowers at that. And then right at the end, I'll, I'll say a little bit about our future plans. So all life depends on plants. I think that most people probably do understand that that's a fact that without plants there would be no other uh, life on earth um, but most people also probably realize just how important our crops are but i think few people realize that those crop species just about 30 different plants are a tiny fraction of plant diversity we have about 30 sorry about 300 thousand flowering plants on earth and my talk is going to focus on the rest of that wild plant diversity and I hope I'll be able to convince you just how important those plants are apart from our major crops because these wild plants are an important source of, of medicine and fuel but nowadays we also recognize that plants are the building blocks of the earth's terrestrial ecosystems and there are many services that those ecosystems provide us including the air we breathe and clean water uh, and everything else and interestingly in the last decade or so environmental economists have started to try and grapple with the economic value of those services and the kind of numbers they came up coming up with run into tens of trillion uh, us dollars a year a few years ago a trillion was a a, a sum that we hardly knew about but nowadays since the banking crisis it's uh, the, the sum a trillion is is uh, unfortunately all too familiar to us if we just focus for a moment on how important wild plants are as a source of food uh, to people around the world in southern africa 30 percent of household livelihoods are accounted for by wild plants and nearly 50 percent of the vegetables consumed by people in Tanzania still come directly from the wild. This is a picture here of uh, our partners in Burkina Faso uh, collecting uh, seeds of a tree species there called Moringa olifera. That's its botanical name, but it has lots of local names as well. And one of its local names is the miracle tree. And it's called the miracle tree because almost every part of this tree is used by people. They use the young fruits and eat them as, as a as, as a vegetable, they extract a medicine from the roots of this tree and they even crush the dried seeds and use that powder to purify water. And of course they chop it down for fuel wood, which is why this tree probably more than anything else is threatened, like so many species um, across the world. Fortunately, this is a species that's now safely conserved both at the Millennium Seed Bank and by our partners in Burkina Faso and those seeds are now readily available. If we turn our attention to the value of wild plants as a source of medicine, of course, the iconic foxglove that we are all aware gave us the drug digitalin, which we use in the treatment of heart disease. 75%, three quarters of the people on earth still rely on wild plants as a source of traditional medicines. Incredibly important in certain cultures, particularly in China and India, for example. And this plant, the rosy periwinkle, a poisonous plant from the tropics, probably been used as a medicine by people in various parts of the world for thousands of years. But only in the last few decades, we've actually studied those chemicals inside this plant. And we now have two drugs derived from it, vincristine and vimblastine, that have completely transformed survival rates for childhood leukemia and lymphoma. So an incredibly valuable wild plant. Ginkgo biloba, the beautiful ginkgo biloba. Many of you, I'm sure, will be familiar with this tree. Uh, there's a, a drug uh, from ginkgo that's worth about 360 million 
um, dollars a year in the United States for, for treating um, heart disease. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is plant diversity across the world is under threat. And there are direct threats. Uh, still the biggest threat to wild plant diversity is land conversion. There's a very simple relationship between biodiversity, the total amount of animals and plant species, and land area available. So if you lose land, you lose biodiversity. It's as simple as that. Climate change is exacerbating these threats. And then there's the indirect threat just simply because the human population is, is rising so sharply, expected to reach 9 billion by 2050. And we'll have to feed all those mouths and inevitably convert land to do so. There are many, many examples of, that I could show you of land conversion, but I always tend to use this one. Um, this is an area of um, southern Brazil, the Mata Atlantica forest, as it was in, in 1945. And this is an area of rainforest about the size of Wales. It always amuses me as a Welshman that things are often measured in units of Wales. Uh, th this is another one. This is about the size of Wales. Uh, and that area of forest almost completely disappeared in 45 years. Almost completely disappeared. We have no idea how many plant species became extinct during that time. And not just the plants, but all the other dependent organisms. How many rosy periwinkles might have been in those forests? We'll, we'll never know. So in 300 years, global forests have shrunk by, by 40%. These are staggering statistics. And climate change, and the picture on the left actually, it was at Tewkesbury um, a few years ago when we had an, another wet summer. I could just, have eas just as easily show you pictures uh, on the news this week from up and down the country in yet another uh, disastrously wet summer. So I think we're all aware that something very odd is going on with our climate. But Sir Nicholas Stern, uh, in his um, report on climate change in 2000, 2006, predicted that between 50 and 40 percent of species could be potentially facing extinction with just two degrees of warming. And I think most climate scientists now believe that is a significant underestimate of, of, of what's going on. And the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment predicts that between a fifth and a third of all plant species on Earth uh, could be facing extinction. And we can actually compare the current rate of extinctions with the background rate of extinctions that we can see in the fossil record. And when we look at that, we find that the current rate of extinctions is at least a thousand times that background rate. And this time it's not caused by some cataclysmic event like a supervolcano or a meteorite, uh, which wiped out the dinosaurs, as we all know, about 65, 65 million years ago. This time, this mass extinction is caused by people. Scientists acknowledge that the sixth mass extinction of life on Earth is already underway, and this time we are the cause of it. OK, so that's the, the gloomy news, uh, the sad story, if you like. Is there any good news? Well, well, yes, there is good news, because at least for our plants on Earth, of the flowering plants on Earth, we are able to save them using fairly simple technology. It turns out that the vast majority of flowering plants, during the course of their evolution, have evolved seeds that can withstand drying. And they've evolved that trait so that they can travel in time and space from one generation to the next. And it's why we can regard seeds as time capsules. And what we do in seed banks is exploit this natural trait that has evolved. We're able to store seeds under conditions which I'll describe, which enables to, us to keep seeds alive for extremely long periods of time. So just by collecting seeds of these threatened plant species around the world, we can save them in our seed banks and give us options for the future, an insurance policy that we would be mad not to invest in. But it's not about locking seeds away in a seed bank for some kind of distant um, catastrophe. It's about having those seeds in a seed bank alive and available for use right now. And we send out 
thousands of samples of seeds every year for important uses, for restoring damaged habitats, and I'll say more about that when I'm focusing on our work in the UK, for reintroducing species that are on the brink of extinction. That plant on the right-hand side is a thing called Cylindrophyllum hallii that was thought to be extinct until it was discovered by our partners in South Africa, and they found a few plants just hanging on literally by their fingertips. We now have seeds of this species safely conserved in South Africa and also at the Millennium Seed Bank, and you can see we are converting those seeds into plants so that they can be reintroduced into the wild. But for me, the most important use of seeds in the seed bank is to bring some of these incredibly important wild plant species into regular cultivation, to, to look for um, the ways in which we can improve rural livelihoods, uh, to um, work on these plants as a source of food and medicine uh, for people, particularly those millions of people who live in the world on, um, uh, at, at a poverty level. So the Millennium Seed Bank Partnership then is a follow-on from the Millennium Seed Bank Project, uh, which we um, fortunately had funding uh, from, from, mainly from the National Lottery, the, the Millennium Commission, and the main target of the Millennium Seed Bank project, which ran from uh, 1997 to 2009, was to conserve 10% of the world's flora. Kiwi is very proud of the fact that we actually delivered that project, both on time and on budget. And now we're able to think about the next phase. This is the purpose statement of this second phase of this venture, which we call the Millennium Seed Bank Partnership. And it's much more explicitly now about using these conserved um, genetic resources to support human well-being. So it's much more explicit about uh, making use of these seeds that we've conserved. We still have a hugely ambitious collecting programme. We aim to collect another 15% of the world's flora in this phase, making it 25% um, of the world's flora hopefully conserved by 2020. It's a truly global project. We're working in, with over 120 institutions in 50 countries worldwide, many developing countries, but not just developing countries. We had a big program in our first phase in the United States and also in Australia. I'm now gonna turn my attention to the question, what do we actually do? What is it, do we actually do in the Millennium Seed Bank Partnership. And the first thing is this collecting program. And to answer the question, well, what is it that we collect with 300,000 plant species out there? How do we, how do we focus? And I've I kind of already addressed that with the previous slide. And we sometimes sum that up with the three E's. Uh, e for endangered, those plants like Cylindrophyllum hallii, that uh, unless we collect them and conserve them, they will be gone, lost forever before we've ever got a chance to study them. E for endemic, which is similar to that, so plants that are unique to a particular region or a particular country, because if we lose them, they're lost from the planet. But the most important of the three E's is E for economic, conserving these plants that are important to people, whether it be as a source of medicine, food, clothing, or even fuel wood. Once we've made a seed collection, the first critical step in keeping those seeds alive is to dry them. And there's a, a little rule of thumb that was developed probably 40 years ago by a, a chap called Harrington, which says that for every 1% that you reduce the moisture content of seeds, which is roughly equivalent to a reduction in humidity of about 10%, you'll double the lifespan of those seeds. So drying seeds down, from the kind of moisture level they would have at the time we collect them, down to the moisture level we use in our seed banks, which is 15% relative humidity, that will increase the storage life by at least 20-fold. So for a seed that might have only lived for six months at the time of harvest, those seeds will now survive for 10 years, and that's a very significant um, factor. Once we've got seeds dry, then the next step which is also very simple, is to, is to seal those seeds because we need to keep them dry. 
We happen to use glass containers in the Millennium Seed Bank, and many of our partners do as well. But other things like foil bags um, are very effective, and there are seed banks around the world that use foil, trilaminate foil, rather than glass. Once we've got these seeds safely sealed, we can then cool them. And this is the next crucial step. So this is a picture inside one of our vaults at the Millennium Seed Bank, which runs at minus 20 degrees centigrade, the same temperature as your domestic freezer at home. And good old Harrington came up with another rule of thumb around the benefit of cooling seeds once you've dried them, which says that for every five degrees you cool, you also double the lifespan. So just imagine cooling seeds down from room temperature, about 20 degrees in this room at the moment, to minus 20, every five degrees down, you double the lifespan. So those two combined effects of drying, followed by cooling, will extend the storage life by orders of magnitude. And this is why we are confident that we can keep seeds of many species alive, not just for decades, hundreds of years in many cases, and some species we are certain will live for thousands of years. So I said that we had successfully conserved 10% of the world's uh, plants by 2009. We now have uh, as of last week, 31,000 plant species conserved in the vaults of the Millennium Seed Bank. We sometimes refer to the vaults as the hottest biodiversity hotspot on Earth. More living plant diversity per square meter there than anywhere else uh, on the planet. And just a little bit about how important technology transfer and science has been to uh, our program. We were very fortunate with the funding that we had from the Millennium Commission that we could share some of that funding, funding with our international partners. In fact, we provided nearly 14 million pounds of direct funding to partners around the world to train people, over 1,300 people trained in seed conservation. Um, also, we shared the technology that we were able to develop with our science program at the Millennium Seed Bank. This is an instrument actually for measuring the moisture uh, at seeds, in seeds at the time of harvest, which um, informs the way in which we then process and, and, and dry and store those seeds. We were also able to um, provide some limited funding to partners, and this is actually a scruffy workshop that happened to be beneath the herbarium at the Mount Cutha Botanic Garden in Brisbane in Queensland, and that small amount of funding that we provided was used as leverage by our Queensland partners that then persuaded the Queensland government to cough up some money to turn that workshop into this state-of-the-art seed conservation facility. So a state-of-the-art lab with a walk-in drying room, which is so important for keeping seeds alive in the moist uh, and, and warm climate of, of Queensland, which is otherwise quite tricky to keep seeds alive for very long. Probably the most important bit of day-to-day -day science we do at the Millennium Seed Bank is setting up germination tests. And we do those germination tests for two reasons. The first one is to check that our seeds are still alive. And still the most reliable way to do that is to periodically take a sample out of the seed bank and sow those seeds and, and check that they still germinate. But the other really important reason we do this is because it's actually the plants that will be needed in the future, not the seeds. And we need to find a way of turning those seeds into plants. Many wild plants are not easy to germinate because they've evolved a, a, a property called dormancy, which means that they only germinate at a particular time and place in nature. And that's something that we need to understand in order to convert seeds into plants. But this is a, another important scientific question for us. Just how long will seeds survive in the seed bank? And just like mice and elephants have different lifespans, then it's the same for seeds of different plant species. We've known for a long time that some seeds are inherently long-lived and some are short-lived. But which, which is which? We're always really interested if anybody can send us ancient seeds. And a few years ago, and this is the, uh, you can just about read that, it's the um, Public Record Office, the National Archive, which coincidentally is near Kew Gardens. And one of the curators at the National Archive, uh, 
a few years ago, was going through this wallet. And you can see it's a very old wallet, and you can see the name of the person that owned this wallet. He was a Dutch merchant called Jan Teerlink. And Jan Teerlink and his wallet was seized by the British Navy off the coast of South Africa in 1803. Jan Teerlink was a merchant coming back from the Far East, stopped off in Cape Town, probably visited the Botanic Garden and got these seed samples that he was going to bring back to Europe, presumably for his garden. Well, they never got there. They ended up, along with it, uh, all his possessions in the Tower of London, and eventually found their way to the National Archive. And this curator, mindful that some seeds could survive for quite a long time, thought of us and sent us these seeds and asked the question, could any of these seeds be still alive? Well, two of those species, there are about 30 species in this wallet, two of them were not only alive, but have gone on to produce these healthy specimens. So on the right there, you can see that leucospermum plant, which is still in our glasshouse to this day and is actually now coming into flower, was grown for, from a seed that was over 200 years old. Now, this was a great news story, and of course, we, we made good mileage out of that. Uh, but also, um, it's great um, supporting evidence for the uh, empirical evidence we've got from research that predicts that seeds can survive for periods as long as this. And of course, these seeds weren't in a seed bank. They were in this wallet uh, that was in the, uh, as I say, the, the, the National Archive and prior to that, the Tower of London. So not under ideal conditions. And I want to say a little bit about enabling use. Because I've emphasised that it's not about just putting seeds in a seed bank and locking the door and tossing away the key for some distant time in the future. It's about using seeds right now. I've also emphasised how important these germination protocols are. The pictures here are of a, a nut from a tree called the Mongongo tree. And it turns out that the Mongongo tree and this nut are um, hugely important to people in southern Africa. Uh, it's a stable food of the sand bush people in southern, southern Africa. Very nutritious nut. But sadly, uh, our partners and other people in South Africa didn't have a means of germinating these seeds. They simply didn't know how these seeds germinated. So there were no young, there was no um, regeneration, natural regeneration going on, just mature trees that were increasingly threatened, um, also being used for, for fuel wood. It turns out that these nuts actually require two things. They need to be scarified, and they also need the stimulus of chemicals in smoke. It turns out that lots of plants that have evolved in those dry tropical ecosystems and Mediterranean ecosystems have evolved with fire and they respond to the chemical signals in smoke to trigger germination. So this was something that we were able to work out in our labs. We've shared that information with our partners and now they are using that method to create seedlings and establish nurseries which will keep this tree going and um, you know, really support in a sustainable way the livelihoods of those people in, in southern Africa. But using seed is also extremely important closer to home, and really that's what our UK Native Seed Hub project is all about. And many of you, I hope, will be aware that over the last couple of years, the government has now really started to recognise just how important Britain's ecological network is, and that it's in danger of, it, it, it's in need of urgent repair. Sir John Lawton uh, published his review in 2010, Making Space for Nature, and last year, uh, DEFRA um, uh, published its first white paper, first natural environment uh, white paper for over 20 years. And so responding to those government imperatives, and also because already at Wakehurst Place we were beginning to uh, think about how we can restore some of the habitats on our estate and work with uh, other people uh, down in, in the Sussex Weald, uh, we decided to uh, launch the, the, the UK Native Seed Hub. And our partners in Sussex and, and elsewhere in the country are currently focusing on this particular habitat, lowland meadows. We have only 2% of our low species rich lowland meadows left uh, compared to pre-war levels. And of course, this is because after the Second World War, 
there was a big push to improve grasslands, to improve um, these uh, meadows for, for cattle grazing uh, to basically um, feed mouths. Uh, unfortunately, the consequence of that is that we've lost um, an incredible amount of this plant diversity, which is extremely valuable. Um, our species-rich meadows are incredibly important for pollinating insects, particularly in months of the year when um, the crop species that they would have been feeding on previously have already been harvested. One of the consequences of the modern approach to agriculture is that you get this sort of boom and bust situation, you know, that, uh, that our pollinating insects are trying to, to deal with. And really, it's the species-rich meadows which help to sustain those uh, insects uh, during those important months. So the, the UK native seed hub aims are to improve the quality, availability and appropriateness of UK native seed, support the native seed industry um, in its effort to provide material to support restoration in, in the United Kingdom. Some of our own experience of using seed um, at Wakehurst that we bought in from commercial seed companies, which we were then able to take into the lab and test, uh, led us to realise that quality um, was often uh, not what it should be uh, and the range of species that were available commercially was um, fairly limited and we felt that with the expertise that we built up over the last uh, 40 years of seed banking at Wakehurst this is something that we really ought to try and share with the industry and help this industry at a time where uh, there is incredible demand, increasing demand for seed of native plants, um, an opportunity for us to help them do a better job. Probably the most important contribution we can make is support, advice and training. Um, and for a number of years we've been working with a great initiative in the Weald, the Weald Meadows Initiative. Uh, we are proud to have been part of the South Downs National Park application for one of the government's 12 nature improvement areas and that bid was successful and we're delighted to be involved in that and we'll be involved in in the collecting of seeds of chalk grassland species uh, and trialing um, um, uh, restoration sites uh, along the the south downs way we've also been talking to the kent wildlife trust recently about a project involving uh, orchid establishment and orchid reintroduction so it's this support, advice and training will be particularly important. But we'll also be doing some seed production of ourselves. And it's interesting for me, having been at Wakehurst for so long, Barbara mentioned i have been there a long time, and I first joined Wakehurst as a student in 74, 75. And in those very early years of the seed bank at Wakehurst, we did have some seed production beds in those days, which was all about trying to establish collections in the seed bank. We, brought in um, seeds from other botanic gardens and we grew that seed uh, in order to stock the seed bank. And we've kind of gone full circle, you know, we've now got almost the entire UK flora stored in the seed bank. Many of those collections are probably too small for any significant use, certainly at a habitat scale. And what we're going to be doing in, in this particular initiative is bulking some of that material up, particularly the species that are not available commercially or rarely available commercially and uh, so that we can then offer the industry larger quantities of high quality seed uh, that they can then turn into commercial crops. So in fact the, the picture there on the right was when we broke ground on this main production site uh, last year. Uh, that's due to be open to the public next Tuesday the 17th of July. So do come and visit Wakehurst. Uh, we're doing our best this year in such a difficult year to do anything on the ground. Next year it will be spectacular because some of the plants we're growing in these beds, uh, including Meadow Clary, for example, Salvia Potensis, one of our most endangered but most beautiful sort of uh, wildflowers, and we have four beds of that here, and it will look stunning next year, so do, do visit. Seed services. We have the laboratory... Um, you know, laboratories at the Millennium Seed Bank, where we have all the skills to solve germination and dormancy problems. Uh, we have a digital, digital x-ray machine where we can check seed quality. And again, these are services that we can offer to support the industry. Um, and you know, we'll uh, later on this year be um, advertising those services through a, a, an update of our website. 
and research as well, and, and research that will focus particularly on how we can improve, improve the germination and propagation techniques for these difficult UK native species. So some, something we're looking at at the moment is this priming of seeds. Uh, these are treatments using osmotic solutions that can often make seeds uh, germinate more uniformly and more quickly in the nursery. And so it's these kinds of techniques which have been developed in the lab uh, that we now want to be able to translate uh, into protocols that commercial partners and commercial nurseries uh, can use routinely to get better performance out of um, UK native plants. But education, you know, Wakehurst Place is the most visited National Trust garden in the UK. So we have a great opportunity and a responsibility to engage with the general public. And I said, the, the production site next week will be open to the general public. There will be interpretation in that site to explain to the general public what we're doing and, and why we're doing it. And the little fella in the bottom left there, you know, is the, is the key point. If we can inspire the next generations about the importance of wild plant diversity, and the importance of conserving and using our native plants, then, then UK biodiversity you know, might be in, in good hands. I've talked about the visitor attraction. That's just some of the plants that we're growing at the moment. And the one in the, in, in the top, in the middle there, pheasant eye. And what a stunning plant this is. It's not really available commercially. It's actually a very rare plant now in the UK. It used to be much more common. It's a plant which we call, it's an archaeophyte, a plant that was probably introduced into the UK hundreds and hundreds of years ago, a plant from the Mediterranean. And this is a plant that you know, we hope to help the industry um, get uh, into production so more people can uh, enjoy it. So where do we go from here then? I hope I've been able to convince you just how important wild plant diversity is and the role that the Millennium Seed Bank Partnership is playing in safeguarding that diversity for future use. These are the targets for the current phase, this period up to 2020, which I touched on earlier. Still a hugely ambitious collecting target. We want to secure 25% of the world's plant species by 2020. The target too, as I've explained, is explicitly about using that material for innovation and adaptation and resilience. And we have major projects now where we have a crop wild relatives project where we are working with the Global Crop Diversity Trust, a project funded by the, the Norwegian government to focus on some of these species that are relatives of the world's most important crops and to ensure that we've got their genes uh, involved in the development of future cultivars that are going to be so important you know, with some of the threats we face. Third target is actually about making this partnership sustainable in the long-term future. Our funding situation is still perilous. Actually, in the first phase, it was more secure, in a sense, because nearly all of our funding came from the National Lottery through the Millennium Commission. This phase is much more challenging. And what is the cost of that? Well, it's about £100 million, which sounds an impossibly large sum of money for our kind of work. But is it? It's about the annual salary bill of a top premiership football club. <laughs> it's uh, approximately the cost of one Eurofighter jet. But if we break that cost down, it's actually only about £2,000 for each plant species that we will safeguard. And look what we get for that. It covers the cost of the exploration, the cost of collecting those seeds, the processing, the storage, the viability testing, the distribution. It's actually a, a lot of value for money. And £2,000 is what an average smoker will spend on cigarettes in a year. It's what Europe spends on toiletries and cosmetics. Every second. Uh, and I think this is, this is the point. You know, £100 million on the face of it sounds like a huge sum of money. But it isn't. It isn't. And, you know, I hope that we are going to be more successful in the future in convincing 
governments, philanthropists, corporate sponsors, that really, you know, this is a small sum uh, to be paid for something which is so important for future generations. So in a nutshell, uh, human livelihoods depend on wild plant diversity, so I think we all get that. Land conversion and climate change, exacerbated yeah, by just the sheer rise in human numbers are its biggest threats. And seed conservation and use is a very cost-effective strategy for combating these current threats. It is so simple. You just dry them, seal them, cool them. It is so simple. We would be mad not to do it. But ultimately, it's people like this. It, it's people like this that I think that our work is really all about. It's giving... Uh, people who are really living in the world on a dollar a day and giving them maybe a better future. Thank you. For more information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.